Action Sports Live. I'm Emily Proud. T-minus two weeks exactly until the NFL draft kicks off in Detroit. And it feels like the closer we get, the more we just start to question everything. So today we are going pick by pick through the first round, working off of our friend and CBS Sports NFL draft analyst, Ryan Wilson's latest mock draft. He joins the show to help show his work alongside our college football analyst, Cooper Patagna, also a member of our scouting team. So we get the reasoning from Ryan, and then we get uh, a little bit more scouting nuggets from our friend Cooper. Ryan, the last time that we spoke, you said that you weren't sure how many more versions of these you had left in you. So tell us now, where are you in the mock drafting process? So on Monday, Emily, my 100, top 100 big board will come out. That'll be on CBS Sports. And then uh, the following week, the week of draft week, I'll have two mock drafts that come out. One, what I would do if I were making all 32 picks in the first round, and then what I actually think will happen will come out the day of the draft, April 25th, uh, Thursday, two weeks from from today as we do this. So that's the plan. We'll see if anything changes, if any trades happen that uh, force me to have to, to make some last-minute changes. But I think, uh, you know, we're down the home stretch, uh, as we like to say. Uh, as we head towards the, the draft on April 25th in Detroit. That's right. I feel like the more mock drafts you do, the more you feel like you have to change things and adjust them. So I like the uh, the idea of just kind of sticking to it at this point. Um, Coop, speaking of, uh, we talked last week a lot about what the scouting process looks like from a 24-7 sports side, but remind people just how important the first round in particular of the NFL draft is, but the draft process as a whole to what you do with the scouting team at 24-7 Sports. It's very important, Emily. You think about last year, they had 13 five stars that got drafted in the first round of the 2023 draft. So you think about 2024, what those numbers look like. I think every year it's a barometer for us, our scouting team at 24 seven sports, we get to kind of see where we stack up, what our rankings look like. And when we project players at the high school level, we're ranking them to where they project in terms of their NFL draft potential. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all going to be really, really big days for us at 24-7 Sports as we get to see what shakes out and uh, get to see how those previous rankings really kind of do up against the NFL model. Yes, and I will do my best to uh, point out some of the guys that uh, correlate to what we originally had them uh, back when they were coming out in high school to what Ryan Wilson now projects them to go in the first round. But with that, guys, let's go ahead and get started with the first pick in the 2024 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select quarterback Caleb Williams. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to say Caitlin Clark just to try to keep the women's <laughs> basketball team going. He's going to be the first overall pick in a few weeks as well. But, right, Caleb Williams, like Caitlin Clark, feels like a layup here. He's the best quarterback in this class for me, and, and it's actually not even that close. Uh, the totality of his work started at Oklahoma when he sent Spencer Rattler to the to the bench. And then in Chicago, what does he do? He gives them uh, their next in line to be the face of the franchise for their organization. They have two first-round picks, and we'll circle back at pick nine here and see what they do there. But you have your franchise quarterback. Ryan Poles finally gets to draft his quarterback as the GM, and he has a chance to come in to be special. Will he be C.J. Stroud year one special? No, because that's a huge ask. But I think if you get 65% of C.J. Stroud in year one, you have to feel really good uh, about the idea of finally finding your franchise quarterback after the Mr. Trubisky thing didn't work out back in 2017 when you traded up for him in the same draft class, incidentally, Cooper, that in included uh, some guy named Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> yeah, this is the guy. I think we've known this for quite some time when it comes to Caleb Williams. Won the Heisman Trophy two years ago. We talked about it last week. Had to chase a lot of points at USC. And if you're Ryan Poles, a young general manager in Chicago, you are running up to Roger Goodell turning in that card and saying, hey, this is my guy. This is who Chicago's been waiting for. Even Justin Fields, I thought he played well enough to maybe deserve another year, but that goes to show what type of talent Caleb Williams is. So Chicago more than likely going to roll forward with Caleb Williams in that train, going to get a really talented quarterback and giving them some credit. They've already done a really good job giving him the infrastructure for him to succeed early there as well. All right. With the second pick in the draft, the Washington Commanders also selecting a quarterback, Jaden Daniels. Yeah, and I said it last week when we talked, Emily, no player had done more for his draft stock than Jaden Daniels over the last uh, football season. In 2023, he was absolutely electric. Uh, it's funny, I went back and watched one of our uh, podcast clips uh, from uh, September, right after Shadur Sanders started lighting things on fire, uh, how well he played in Colorado. 
And the conversation then was, hey, Shadur Sanders is going to be quarterback three behind Drake May and, and Caleb Williams. And here comes Jane Daniels out of nowhere. And in Washington, what does he give you? Again, you need a franchise quarterback, new GM, new head coach, offensive coordinators, Cliff Kingsbury. And Cliff has a history of working with these dual threat quarterbacks. And you can see here how dangerous Jane Daniels is in the open field. And uh, one of the things I had a scout tell me the LSU Pro Day a few weeks ago is that Jane Daniels can demoralize the defense. If he if you're able to cover his wide receivers, he can beat you with his legs, rip off 40, 50 yard runs, and you are in worse shape than you were the previous play, even though you played pretty well defensively. And I think that's what he brings to Washington. And I think uh, if they build around him and they have a pretty good roster so far, they have a chance to be pretty good pretty quickly in a division that maybe could be wide open. The Eagles struggled a little bit. The Cowboys, maybe they come back to earth. And this is Washington's chance to take a step forward. I'm an LSU boy. I watch every LSU game this past season. You said it in terms of Jane Daniels being the guy that can like demoralize the defense. Look no further than that game against Florida last year and what he did pretty single-handedly. He's pretty tremendous. And you think about the Washington Commanders and maybe some uh, relations to LSU last season. LSU had one of the worst statistical defense under then defensive coordinator Matt House last year. The Commanders, well, they're in a similar situation, and uh, Ryan pointed at it out. You think about Cliff Kingsbury, the quarterbacks that he's worked with. What is the great equalizer for any young quarterback, especially if you have th that trait? I think the legs for Jane Daniels is what makes him so special. And the other thing with the arm, it's gotten better and better and better every year. And now, all of a sudden, I think a guy at the beginning of the season, a lot of people thought was going to be a day three pick, works himself now into that top ten category. Could be one of the first names off the board. Coming out of the 2019 class, he was the number one dual threat quarterback, top 35 player nationally. So pretty similar to where he is projected just a few years later. With the third pick in the NFL draft, the New England Patriots also selecting a quarterback. This time, it's Drake May. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the, the Patriots can't come out of this draft without a quarterback. Jacoby Brissett's a... Uh, a great solid veteran that you start for three or four games, but he's not a long-term solution. And Drake May didn't have the season that Jaden Daniels or even Caleb Williams had. And in fact, his season w was up and down. And you could point to the offensive line play and the lack of playmakers after Josh Downs left for the NFL and, and Tez Walker was suspended the first few games. When Tez Walker did show up, he proved to be that deep threat. But I think the lack of consistency is what has some people concerned about Drake May in the short term. But in the long term, you have to understand he's only played two years. And I think his best football is ahead of him. And if you're New England, you need a franchise quarterback desperately. The Mac Jones experiment blew up in everyone's faces from Matt Patricia to Bill Belichick to Mac Jones. And I think you reset it here with Gerard Mayer, the new head coach, Elliot Wolf, the new GM, and now you have your franchise quarterback going forward. The only thing is, Cooper, you have to make sure you build around him both along the offensive line and get him some help at wide receiver. That would be my biggest concern, right? You brought that up. The other thing you brought up, he's just a puppy, right? He's still pretty young, but you think about the prototype in Drake May, everything that he has to offer. He's 6'4 plus, he's 225 pounds. The other thing about Drake May, he is a really – really good athlete i love watching this guy in the open field so he's everything you want at the position i love drake may if i was sitting in a war room that would be one of those guys that i'm just so intrigued by is it going to work out i don't know but if you are a gambler you want to roll the dice drake may is that type of dude new regime there in new england so we'll see what happens but if a quarterback's on the board which one will be i expect the patriots to go in that direction with the fourth pick in the NFL draft, the Arizona Cardinals select the first wide receiver coming off the board, Malik Neighbors. Yeah, let's mix it up a little bit here, Emily. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the favorite, and I've, I've heard that Arizona actually likes Marvin Harrison Jr., but for the sake of our discussion and the fact that I'm fresh off the LSU Pro Day, uh, I'll go with Malik Neighbors. I, I don't know if you can go wrong with either player, and I would just point to a few years ago when CeeDee Lamb was wide receiver one and some guy named Justin Jefferson was, was a wide receiver five. Uh, it turns out Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb are both great players, even though they went uh, several picks apart. Malik Neighbors is, is special. And if you're Arizona uh, with Kyler Murray, who played really well after coming back from that ACL, you don't need the quarterback here, so you settle with him. Jonathan Gannon had a great first year as a head coach. He's a defensive guy, but I'm certainly he understands uh, the importance of getting Kyler some weapons. And Malik Neighbors is special. He's special to all three levels, ran a 4-3-5 unofficially at his pro day, had the 42-inch vertical, and all those things showed up on tape in the fall. I love his game. Perhaps Marvin Harrison does, in fact, go here. But wherever uh, Malik ends up, I, I think he has a chance to be a, a huge contributor early on as a rookie.
Ryan, I love what you did here because I love the potential pairing of a guy like Kyler Murray and a guy like Malik Neighbors. You think about Jaden Daniels, the guy that we just got done talking about, everything that he could do with his legs operating outside of the pocket, especially outside of that play structure. That's where Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels did a lot of damage. And you think about what Malik Neighbors can do after the catch, when the play breaks down, I think that's kind of when he's at his best as a creative playmaker. So you put those two together, I think that combination for Arizona uh, is definitely something worth looking at if you're that regime, that organization. They got two great options there if they decide to go at receiver with Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. So it's going to be a pretty interesting decision. We have a trade alert with the fifth pick in the NFL draft. The Chargers will trade the pick to the Minnesota Vikings, and the Vikings will select quarterback J.J. McCarthy. So a lot of moving parts here, uh, Emily, and I, I think this is going to be a realistic scenario in terms of the Vikings trade up at some point. They have pick 11, which is their own pick. They traded back into the first round a few weeks ago to get pick 23. So you get two first-round picks. You don't get two first-round picks to draft two offensive linemen. Uh, you're moving up for a quarterback. Sam Darnold's currently under, under contract. We know that Kirk Cousins is now in Atlanta, and they have a huge need here. So they go get J.J. McCarthy, who is – uh, one of the most talked about players in this draft class, incredibly charismatic, great leader, wasn't asked to do a bunch in Michigan, but when he was asked to do a bunch, especially on third down, he was special at times. And you, you have a small sample size, so you're going to have to extrapolate what's that, what that looks like at the next level. But for me, if you're going to take a young quarterback short on experience, and J.J.'s only 21 years old, Kevin O'Connell is the guy you want coaching that kid up. Uh, perhaps Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan are at the top of the list, but KOC is number three. So they have to go get their quarterback. They're going to overpay for it. It's going to cost them a 2025 20, first round as well, almost certainly. But if they feel like this is a guy and they feel that Kevin O'Connell can get the most out of them, I get why you have to do it because you can have uh, players that are all pros at every other position. If you don't have a quarterback, you're not going to be able to win consistently. Yeah, and to your point, Ryan, I think it makes too much sense for Minnesota that's got a lot riding on it. You talk about the draft capital that they have. They got some ammunition to move up. They're one of those teams, Minnesota, Denver, Las Vegas. We'll talk about those guys a little bit later, but I think you're going to see one of those teams move up into the top five. J.J. McCarthy, it seems like he's got a rocket strapped to his back in terms of his draft stock and everything you talked about, the intangibles, along with the developmental upside at the quarterback position, you pair that up. And I love the potential marriage between a J.J. McCarthy and a Kevin O'Connell. They got everything else there as well. You mentioned Justin Jefferson earlier in the show. Uh, those two together, especially for a young quarterback, can do a lot for his confidence. With the sixth pick, the New York Giants select wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. Emily, this feels like a layup of Marvin Harrison Jr. sitting there at six. There's not a lot to discuss. <laughs> Uh, Saquon Barkley's gone, so you lost some uh, some playmaking in the backfield. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the, uh, automatically the best player in this offense when he shows up. You give Daniel Jones one last chance to prove himself with the best wide receiver, not only in this draft class, but a guy who would have been the first wide receiver taken a year ago and, and probably uh, the several years prior to that. So this feels pretty easy to me. Daniel Jones is excited. He gets one last opportunity, and Marvin Harrison Jr. goes to the biggest market in the NFL. Ryan, I'm going to I'm going to take some privileges with my time since I think everybody knows Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr., all his abilities as well. If there is a quarterback on the board at number six, we know the Giants have Daniel Jones. They're invested with him somewhat, it kind of feels like. But if one of those guys, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy is there, do you think the Giants go ahead and take an arm there? You know, it's funny. We did a mock draft today on what the first pick the podcast I do with Rick Spielman. I had the Giants trading up to four <laughs> to get J.J. McCarthy because, to your point, Daniel Jones has struggled with injuries and consistency. And if Brian Dable can't get the most out of you, like as he did with Josh Allen and Buffalo, you, you wonder how much farther down that road you want to get. So I think there's going to be serious conversations about it. And if you love those quarterbacks, even more than Marvin Harrison Jr., I think you have to do it. Cool. I like it. I like it. Yeah, that's a, it's so interesting to see the potential trade partners who could trade up to some of those early round picks. I've seen the Patriots potentially trading back, um, but uh, the best time to grab a quarterback, Ryan Wright, is when you don't need one necessarily. And um, I think that you could maybe argue though that the Giants could use one uh, definitely for the future. Let's go to the seventh <laughs> pick in the NFL draft, and that is the Tennessee Titans selecting offensive tackle Joe Alt. So the wide receivers are gone, and I have thought in the past about what happens if Malik Neighbors is, happen is sitting there at seven. What do you do for, mm -hmm. for your guy, Will Levis, uh, even though you got him some help at wide receiver? But this is easy. I took the, the left tackle, Joe Walt, 
and you put him next to Peter Skronsky's last year's first round pick, the left tackle who kicked inside out of Northwestern, and you allow Will Levis to have time to flourish in the pocket and, and see if you can get the most out of him. This felt like a, a pretty easy choice for me, Coop, because if you can't protect your quarterback, it doesn't matter who's back there. And this is one more step in that direction to giving Will Levis time to to do the things that we we wanted to see more consistently in Kentucky and the Titans are looking to see more consistently in Nashville. Yeah, it's a pretty good uh, one-two punch there. You talk about Peter Skaronsky, who they got out of Northwestern in the first round last year, and then Joe Walt. I mean, both those guys just scream solid, right? Like one of the best at their positions, Joe Walt, six foot eight. You talk about a guy that's played in a lot of games, a lot of starting experience in South Bend as well. So when you talk about an immediate plug-and-play starter that's going to be able to play at a high level, all those tackles, you're trying to situate those guys. Where do they kind of stack up on the board? It is very, very difficult to live in a world where you don't see Joe Alt having more than a decade career playing at a really high level. With the eighth pick in the NFL draft, the Atlanta Falcons select edge Jared Verse. So Emily, I gave some consideration to Roma Dunes. I hear just to keep the uh, skill position players going in the top 10 uh, uh, one more year for the Falcons, but I, I took the the wiser choice and they need to bolster the second, uh, the, uh, the pass rush, excuse me, the edge rush position. And the question becomes then Jared first over Dallas Turner. I like them almost equally, but I think Jared first is a little further along in his development. He's a little more stout against the run. And, uh, I, I think he gives them the edge rush juice that they have been lacking in recent years. And, uh, you know, that's Jane Daniels. He's running through right there and that's all over the tape for him. So this felt pretty easy for me, Coop, because now you get edge rush help. Uh, on day one and productivity on day one for a Falcons defense that played well last year. And I think they have a chance to, to be much improved uh, this year under their new head coach. I was going to ask you that question between Jared Verse and Dallas Turner, but you, you seem to uh, have taken the words right out of my mouth. I love Jared Verse. Just watching the tape, got to dig back in on him this morning. I mean, you talk about just an explosive player with violent hands, his ability to move opposing offensive linemen, uh, this is the type of guy that lives in people's dreams and nightmares, uh, and he is certainly the latter in terms of what he can do. I love him. I love his motor. You pair that up, uh, the ability, and then his high intensity off the edge. You can also slide him inside situationally. So I think similar to Joe Alt, but on the defensive side, this is going to be a guy that's going to have an immediate impact for your defense on day one. Chicago Bears back up at the podium for pick number nine, and they will take the other edge that you mentioned in Dallas Turner. And again, Roma Dunze will be a consideration here, but I think after you saw what Montez Sweat, Sweat did a year ago after he was traded from Washington and that defense turned a corner, uh, front seven, Dallas Turner has that sort of juice. Uh, we talked to Will Anderson, his former teammate, back in the fall, and, and he said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. By the time Dallas leaves Alabama, I think he'll be a better player than I was. And uh, it turned out that they're, they're pretty close, and we saw how well Will Anderson played as a rookie. So if they get that sort of production, Will Anderson-type production from Dallas in year one in Chicago. That team is legit going to have a chance to make the playoffs if Caleb think, it turns out to be the guy who we think he is as well. So you get Caleb at one, Dallas at nine, and, and this team suddenly looks completely different than they did 12 months ago. I heard somebody say uh, he's no Will Anderson. I don't, I don't know who is. Will Anderson is one of the best college defenders we've seen in quite some time. But when you think about Dallas Turner, the athlete that he is, 34-and-a-half-inch arms, he was 40-plus inches on the bird. He also ran in the mid four fours. You think about the developmental upside. I love his ability to get to the passer. I think he can actually grow in the run game. There are some really positive signs in playing strong at the point of attack. I think that's an area he's going to have to continue to improve. But you said it. I mean, you get Caleb Williams foundational piece at number one. If you can go back at number nine, whether it's a Dunes Day, Dallas Turner, you're either going to get a receiver one or you're going to get a cornerstone guy and a pass rusher that you can build around like Dallas Turner. So Chicago certainly going to be in great shape, not only with the number one pick, but the number nine pick as well. Jared Verse surprised a lot of people coming from the FCS ranks. Dallas Turner did not. He is a former five-star and was was the number one rated edge in the 2021 class. Finally, here he goes at number 10. Ryan's been wanting to pick him the last few picks, but it is wide receiver Roma Dunze to the New York Jets. And I can never be satisfied, Emily, because while Roma Dunze makes a ton of sense here, I often I also consider Brock Bowers because they have some needs to tie in, and Brock Bowers isn't really a tight end because he can line up anywhere, but Roma Dunze is the pick here. Garrett Wilson said at the end of last year, a frustrating season for the Jets. 
Uh, he said something has to change. And Roma Dunze is the change that the Jets need. Aaron Rodgers will be back there. And he, this contested catch is all over his tape, but don't get it twisted. He can stack DBs all day long. He has that deep speed. And I love the way he plays down the field. You can line him up outside or inside. And if anyone will get the most out of it, it'll be Aaron Rodgers. And that will make Garrett Wilson's life eminently easier. I love Roma Dunze, and there's a chance he's – all three of these receivers, by the way, are, are gone prior to th- these top ten picks here, Coop. Yeah, I think the, the, the Jets would just have to be absolutely floored if Dunze is there at nine. But you mentioned, I mean, there is a scenario where that could actually happen. And Aaron Rodgers, obviously, coming off that Achilles injury, you got Garrett Wilson. Like you said, the frustrations there last two years with Zach Wilson. They need some consistency in the passing game, they've invested in the offensive line. Roma Dunze has drawn comparisons to one of the best of all time in Larry Fitzgerald. His ability and his balance and body control down the field is pretty rare. That's how you would describe it. So love Dunze, obviously a player we've been tracking for a long time, a guy that was ranked a four-star coming out of Bishop Gorman. Uh, he has developed beautifully under Kalen DeBoer and is going to be one of those guys uh, just going to be able to change the dynamic of an offense as soon as he steps on the field. All right, guys, we ran through the top 10 really fast. Let's just remind you, we got to run on quarterbacks in the, we got four in the top five picks, two Heisman Trophy winners, a national champion, three wide receivers also get picked up, but let's move on to the 11th pick in the NFL draft. This is another trade, not another trade, the same trade, but we get the uh, recoup here, the LA Chargers finally picking, going to the podium and selecting offensive tackle J.C. Latham. Yeah, J.C. Latham is a grown man, even by right tackle standards. And I think if you're Jim Harbaugh coming to L.A., hiring Greg Roman as your offensive coordinator, it would be imperative. In part to keep Justin Herbert upright, uh, in part because you do it pretty well and you can uh, take over games that way. So what are you doing if you're the Chargers with J.C. Latham? Uh, you're getting a starting right tackle day one. That's a huge need for you right now. And now you have three starters on the offensive line who are recent first-round picks. Rashawn Slater, the left tackle, Zion Johnson, the left guard, and now J.C. Latham, and everything follows from that. Justin Herbert, you get more out of him. You keep the defense on the off the field, which is something you want to do until they figure out who they're going to be in L.A., and you have a chance to compete, Coop, in that incredibly difficult division that starts, of course, with, with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. It's almost like you got an insurance policy built in with Latham, and you look at the tackles, and, and you're trying to figure out, all right, which guy kind of fits me in L.A.? And you brought it up with Latham. This is a guy plug and play right tackle position. But if it doesn't work out there in the off chance, you can slide him inside the guard. I think a lot of people think he's got all pro potential there as well. Former five star IMG Academy by way of Wisconsin. Think about IMG, the guys that they have produced. Evan Neal, J.C. Latham going to be another one. Tyler Booker in the chamber as well at Alabama. Uh, So this is one of those guys for a long time. There's been a lot of interest in him. Had all the physical tools, develops beautifully in Tuscaloosa. Now, more than likely, we're going to see him hear his name called in the first top 15 picks of the NFL draft. Elsewhere in the AFC West, the Denver Broncos selecting at 12. They will pick cornerback Terrian Arnold. Right, and just to reiterate, cornerback, not quarterback, (laughs) even though that's what they desperately need. And they might be a trade-up candidate, but they don't have a lot of ammunition in terms of draft capital or players to to part ways with in order to try to get that quarterback. They're still trying to pay off Russ Wilson's deal that obviously didn't work out. So instead, they bolster that defense, and Terry and Arnold is one of my favorite players in this draft class. Uh, We had a chance to talk with him at the Combine. Good luck meeting someone with uh, more charisma and more self-confidence. You put him opposite Patrick Sertan Jr., his former teammate at Tuscaloosa, and you have an opportunity to shut down some of those big play players and playmakers in the AFC West. you got to fi- get the offense figured out with the quarterback position, but I think you can't go wrong here with this cornerback in Terry and Arnold, Cooper. Confidence is key, especially at the corner position. You want those guys kind of like borderline arrogant, but humility is important as well because that's what comes with that position. You mentioned Patrick Sertan Jr., one of those guys probably got nitpicked throughout the process, one of the cleanest prospects at the corner position that we've seen in quite some time. Terry and Arnold are not that much different, right? So if you're Denver and the quarterback's not on the board, the defensive side, you really can't go wrong with a guy like Terry and Arnold. The other thing about him that I mentioned with another uh, Alabama Crimson Tide standout, I love his versatility. I mean, this guy played a lot of nickel in Tuscaloosa at that star position. So you think about his position flex, what he can do matchup-wise defensively, give Sean Payton 
in that defense uh, a lot of create creativity, flexibility, how they want to attack. And he is a strong, heady player. You talk about the intangibles. Everybody loves this kid, how he goes about his business, super mature, coachable as well. You cannot have enough of those guys. All right. The Raiders coming up at 13, and they will select quarterback. I'll be very specific about that. And Michael Penix Jr. How about that? Yeah, so this is going to be interesting. And some teams are not high on Michael Penix Jr. as a first-round pick. Others are. I, I think he has a chance to go to the bottom half of the first round. But there's uh, rarely – uh, or it's not uncommon for teams to overdraft quarterbacks because they need them. And I think when you have Aiden O'Connell on the roster who did well uh, as a rookie last year in spot duty and you sign Gardner Minshew, those are short-term solutions. If you like what Michael Penix Jr. brings to the table, and there's a lot to like, especially down the field, I, I think he makes some sense here. Maybe the Viking, uh, the Las Vegas in real life tries to trade down a few spots, but if you're worried about another team moving up, you have to take him here. There are worse things to do than take a Mike, Michael Penix Jr. based on the season he had at Washington last year. I think, Cooper, if his season had ended after the Texas game, people are talking more about how good he was. But after the loss to Michigan, a really great Michigan defense, some people are down on him, and I'm not quite sure why. Well, I want to concede my time here on the scouting report. I want to, I want to throw it back to you on Michael Penix. This is uh, a quarterback with a wide range of opinions. These guys are very fascinating to me, but it only takes one. It takes one team to believe in a Michael Penix Jr. in his skill set. And you think about all they've done under Kalen DeBoer over the last two years, just win, win, win. What have you seen in Michael Penix that you love so much about him to envision him as a top 15 draft pick? So, Cooper, I think he's the best deep ball thrower in this draft class. And, yes, he does have three wide receivers that are going to get drafted very high, helping him out. I love his movement skills inside the pocket. I think he moves with urgency but still keeps his eyes downfield. He struggles throwing the ball in the middle of the field and, and on intermediate routes. He's laser-focused on those deep down-the-field routes, and we've seen that uh, in the highlights. And I get those concerns, but here's the thing. I, and I know that scouts have mixed opinions, and coaches seem to like him a little more because they have he has the skills that, you can work with if you're a coach. And I think that's what makes him such an exciting prospect. I understand the the concerns from, from some parts of the scouting department. Uh, but I come back to this. If we're talking about tape, the, the tape is there for me. And I know there's the injury history, and I, I get that part of it. But I here's the thing, Coop. Uh, Kenny Pickett was the 20th overall selection a couple of years ago. On no planet is Kenny Pickett better than Michael Penix Jr. in my mind. All right. Perfectly said. Uh, who would have thought that playing in a national championship game could somehow hurt your draft stock? But it's uh, <laughs> the taste that you left in your mouth the last time you saw him out there. So it does make sense. Uh, with the 14th pick, the New Orleans Saints select offensive tackle Olu Fashionu. Yeah, this is another another best case scenario for an organization. Trevor Penning hasn't quite worked out at left tackle. They traded for him a few years ago. And that hasn't uh, come to fruition yet. And right tackle Ryan Ramchek, we're not sure if he's going to be able to play. He has a knee injury that's, that could be one that, that causes him to miss parts of the season, if not the entirety of the season. Uh, Fashionu is one of the most intriguing players in this draft because of his athleticism. Uh, he's relatively new to football. He returned to school last year. He would have been a top 10 pick a year ago, I feel like, Hoop. And I love the fact that he is so incredibly athletic. I think he's going to get stronger. I think he's going to get more technically sound. And he's a huge get for the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, Saints can't miss here. I, obviously, an organization I follow closely growing up at season tickets since I was five. But the Saints, a couple years ago, they go out, they get Trevor Penning. He's dealt with lower extremity issues, and this is a guy that struggled to anchor as well. It just has not worked out there. And then you mentioned on the opposite side, Ryan Ramchek. So even at 14, the Saints might have some options. There might be some guys on the board they didn't expect. They might be in a BPA situation, but because – of how they have drafted and how they've addressed that position, an unfortunate circumstance with Ryan Ramchek. I think the Saints are going to be really kind of pigeonholed here with what they can do uh, at the 14th pick. And I think you said it, Fashanu, one of those names at 14, a guy that you can grow with, uh, maybe not the floor of a Joe Alt, but maybe one of the highest ceilings of all the tackles on the board. At 15, the Indianapolis Colts select cornerback Quinian Mitchell. Yeah, Emily, I'm interested to see what Anthony Richardson looks like in year two when he's healthy. He he was off to a fast start in that Shane Sykin offense. I think Shane Sykin is the exact coach that he needs. On the other side of the ball, they did some good things as well. Juju Brents, their second-round pick last year, I liked a lot coming out of Kansas State. He's going to be penciled in as a starter. They drafted Jalen Jones out of Texas A&M later in the draft. Kenyon Mitchell being the other starter or someone who gets at least a lot of playing time in year one. Long, fast, physical 
took over the Senior Bowl in the one-on-one drills, which you don't see very often because it favors wide receivers and quarterbacks. And while he's dropped some balls, he has PBU and uh, the ability to come down with the ball in the end zone as well. So I love the physicality, and I love the fact that he competed against higher-level uh, competition, Coop, once he got to the Senior Bowl. Yeah, I like Quinn Young Mitchell a lot. And one of those guys wouldn't be surprised. I don't think he would be Ryan either. He's the first corner that comes off the board, even above a guy like Terry and Arnold. And I'll just use this time to say, because we always talk about it, we want to tie it into the rankings, that postseason exposure. And for this example, for Quinn Young Mitchell, it's the senior bowl. That opportunity to go good on good, it applies across all levels. We talk about it all the time. Uh, with the rankings council, we'll talk about the All American Bowl, the Under Armour All America game, Alabama Mississippi All Star game. It's the equivalent, right? So Quinion Mitchell has made himself some money. And the other thing I have to say about him, you know, kudos to him in the transfer portal NIL era, sticking it out at Toledo from Florida. Uh, it just goes to show the NFL, they will find you no matter where you are. Quinion Mitchell, definitely one of the better players in this draft. I love that. At 16, the Seahawks are selecting interior offensive lineman Troy Fatanu. Emily, I'll be, hard, uh, I'll be honest with you. It's hard for me to pass on Byron Murphy here, but I'm going to go with interior offensive line and Troy Fatanu. He can play, obviously, left tackle and play at a high level, but you got Charles Cross there today, but Lucas in that same draft to play right tackle. So you bring in Fatanu to bolster the interior. Maybe there's a time in the future where you can kick him outside because he has that versatility, but I think you get one more. Uh, weapon, if you can call him a weapon, along the offensive line to help Geno Smith protect Geno Smith because when Geno's protected, he can deal. And he's been playing at a high level the last few years. And continuing to protect him will only make that easier for Geno in a pretty tough division. Yeah, we're going to have to get Troy Fatan and some knee pads. We talked about that last week. He's got the volleyball <laughs> background, so that's no surprise. But you said it, Ryan. I mean, he's got left tackle versatility. You can slide him inside the guard. We've been having this conversation since he was in high school at Liberty in Las Vegas. We always thought he was going to be a guard. He ends up being one of the best left tackles in the country. So you talk about foot quickness, body quickness, just overall raw athleticism. Troy Fatan has got it all. He's also a pretty nasty dude at the line of scrimmage, too. So brought it up last week. I think it's important. If he's on the board here for Seattle, there is a lot of connections there. Ryan Grubb, the former OC, coming over from UW, and also Scott Huff, his former offensive line coach. So a lot of comfort there in Seattle with Troy Fatanu. All right, Ryan, in your mock draft, the Jags doing backflips in the room right now that uh, Byron Murphy is available. They will take him at number 17. Yeah, this is a pretty easy choice for me. Uh, they have some needs at cornerback, but the top two corners are gone. Maybe they think about wide receiver here. But Byron Murphy is special. You did sign Eric Armstead, and you just re-upped Josh Allen. Those all make sense. But Byron Murphy makes your defense immediately better, and he makes it so that you don't have to have shutdown corners because he is consistently in the backfield. We saw that uh, throughout the 2023 season. We saw it in Texas' final game where he got Michael Penix Jr. off the spot consistently. I, I love everything about what Byron Murphy brings to the field. Uh, he is going to be taking on double teams and winning. He'll be shooting gaps all day long. He's a really, really good football player. Yeah, this dude is the man. Uh, we were gushing over him last week, and one of my favorite players in all of draft. I mean, you just turn on the tape, and every time it seems like this guy is making a play, I don't want to reach there. But Aaron Donald was kind of the name that came up. And as he goes, you think about a guy like Byron Murphy, what he can bring to the table. Uh, he is such a disruptive presence on the interior defensive line. And everything that he can do is position versatility. I love his athleticism in the backfield as well. He's the all-around guy. If he is somehow sitting there at number 17, you just re-signed Josh Allen. Uh, you got to love the idea of just putting this guy in the middle like a grenade and just blowing everything up. At 18, the Bengals will select the tight end, Brock Bowers. And I mentioned, Emily, there's a chance Brock Bauer goes 10th to, to the Jets, and, and that would make all the sense in the world. He's a top 10 talent, but sometimes tight ends get pushed down. And if he lands in Cincinnati, that is bad news for the rest of the AFC. We saw what Sam Laporta meant for that Detroit team last year as a second-round pick. I think that's the type of production you're getting in year one from Brock Bowers. He only weighed 241. He plays like he's 255. He got so much better as a blocker in 2023, and he is a game changer. You line him up in line, in the slot, outside, in the backfield. He can do everything, and then he can outrun guys to the end zone. I love the idea of him catching passes, Coop, from Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. 
a favorite fit here uh, for me and Joe Burrow. I mean, you think about that 2019 team at LSU. Nobody ever talks about Thaddeus Moss, and for good reason, right? He was kind of like the leftover guy, but he was a safety blanket. So you think about giving Joe Burrow that type of option, a guy that's so dynamic, certainly in line. You can flex him out as well. Uh, and a guy that's been one of the best players, not only at his position, but in all in college football since he stepped on the field from Napa, California. Like, I cannot bring that up enough. Uh, pretty crazy to see what he's done in the collegiate level uh, at the University of Georgia under Kirby Smart. Uh, this guy going to be playing in the NFL for a long, long, long time. At 19, there is no replacement for Aaron Donald, but the Rams will bring in some defensive line help by selecting Johnny Newton. Yeah, and this is the first first round pick for Sean McVay, I think, since he's arrived in L.A. back in 2017. So that's wild in and of itself. And then Johnny Newton, you get a guy that folks sort of forgot about, Coop, because he had the foot injury and Byron Murphy came under the scene. In, in November and December, uh, but he is a game changer as well. He's incredibly twitched up for an interior offensive lineman. They got Kobe Turner in the third round last year, and he had a great start to his career. Uh, they drafted Byron Young out of Tennessee. He did some work as well. They've done a great job of drafting guys outside the first round. With their first round pick, they do try to replace Aaron Donald. That's going to have to take a, it'll be a village type situation, but I think that's a step in the right direction with how good Johnny Newton was, uh, not only just last year, but in 2022 with all those other players that got drafted on that defense. We didn't get to talk about Newton last week, but he's kind of a bull in a china shop, different than a guy like Byron Murphy. But in terms of the position flex, you can kind of move him around a little bit. And I love the motor. You talked about him being twitched up. So quick twitch, explosive for his size. I think the other thing, he's got Jared Burst heavy hands, right? His ability to move offensive linemen at the point of attack. And this is a guy that will not be moved. He is an earth mover himself. So I love his ability. Uh, especially on the interior, what he brings. And his motor runs hot, and that's certainly something. Even outside the ability of Aaron Donald, what he brought, that intensity, play in and play out, uh, he's rare in that category. I think Newton will certainly help in that direction, replacing that. At 20, the Pittsburgh Steelers will select offensive tackle Talise Fuanga. Yeah, so a couple things to consider here, Emily. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson still on the board. They desperately need help inside, but instead they decide to get the right tackle position taken care of with Tully Fuaga. And this is pretty simple for me if you're Omar Khan, Coop, because here's what you do. Broderick Jones, your first-round pick last year, he's now your starting left tackle, no questions asked. Tully Fuaga is your starting right tackle. Uh, you have some interior offensive linemen who are playing well. You're going to have to circle back and get that center help in rounds two or after that. But this this guy, I mean, the the – Anger with which he plays, the control, and you see there just how strong he is. He's a good athlete. He moves well in space, and once he gets his hooks on you, it's a wrap. If you're going to go with the Arthur Smith offense, it's going to rely heavily on the run. You get your new quarterbacks in there. I think you could do much worse than Tully Pulaga. It's rainy up there in Corvallis all the time. You're watching those games late night, Pac-12 network. This dude just nasty as all get out. He just belongs to play. In the AFC North division, uh, what he brings to the table, right tackle position. I love uh, his temperament, the way that he plays the game. Uh, and this is a guy, uh, quite honestly, over the last couple of weeks, we've heard him go as high as that maybe J.C. Latham conversation. So it all really kind of depends on how you stack those tackles. I think this would be great value. Along with Cincinnati, Brock Bowers, I think this would be another great personnel fit for the Pittsburgh Steelers. All right, let's recap those picks 11 through 20. The fifth quarterback in the first round goes in Michael Penix Jr. to Vegas. But uh, this group, guys, just seems to be all about the big guys. you got four offensive linemen and two defensive linemen. A guy that Ryan just mentioned who is available is available no more because at number 21, the Dolphins will select offensive lineman Jackson Powers Johnson. So, Emily, they signed Aaron Brewer in free agency from Tennessee, and, and he's undersized, and he struggled at times to hold the point. And while he could be the starter for sure, I think Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, he struggles not at all in terms of uh, holding the point. He is uh, big by center standards. He's over 315 pounds, and he moves well in space, as you see here. We had a chance to talk with him at the combine, and he, he is a great dude. Uh, takes football very seriously, but also pretty laid back. Uh, and has the temperament you want in your center and that he's smart, he knows what he needs to do, and he's there to take care of your quarterback. And uh, we understand that when Tua's upright, he can crush you. When Tua gets hit, it's a problem. So I love the idea of JPJ here. Uh, we'll see where he goes. He could go a little higher than here, I think, Coop, or maybe slips a little bit, but I think this is the range where he comes off the board. I worked for Mario Cristobal, I think, 2020, uh, 2021 class at Oregon and Jackson Powers Johnson. 
was part of that class. And Mario Cristobal was just infatuated with this guy. And if you know anything about Mario Cristobal, he's an offensive line guy first. And it was Jackson Powers Johnson, those two, I mean, meant to be together, right? And we get him to Eugene. He's everything that we thought he was. And you talk about the center position. I said it last week. I mean, if there was a definition of it, it would be this guy, super cerebral, very smart, outgoing personality. But when he gets on that football field, he flips a switch. He is a nasty dude. But the type of guy, when you go to war on the gridiron, that's the type of guy that you want to follow. So Jackson Powers Johnson, in terms of the center position, if you have a need there, he's one of the best guys on the market. Just tell by the headshot with his tongue sticking out that he is a center through and through. Those uh, interior offensive linemen always uh, bring in the fun. At number 22, the Philadelphia Eagles will select corner Cooper DeGene. Emily, their secondary was decimated by injury and Nixie and every other uh, negative thing you could say about them last season uh, and part derailed their season. So what do you do? You go get help in that secondary with Cooper DeGene. Fantastic athlete. Six feet, 200 pounds. There's some conversation that maybe he uh, plays some slot, maybe plays some safety. You see the ball skills there. He's a return guy as well. He, he broke his uh, fibula late in the season, so he didn't work out till last week. Ran 4-4-3, and that's how he plays. And I think in Philadelphia, he has a chance to contribute right away because they need help in the secondary. And some of the guys that are starting at cornerback outside are, are getting a little long in the tooth. And Cooper is the type of athlete that you feel like transitions well to the next level. And that versatility, Coop, means you can move them all over the secondary. It always feels like the board just falls beautifully for Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles. And this is one of those positions where you can see Cooper DeGene uh, is a guy that they would be able to add in their defensive secondary while filling a need as well. One of the best players on the board. You talked about that versatility. I think a lot of teams see him playing in the nickel, but you could also play him on the outside. Similar to how we kind of talked about Terry and Arnold. I love that super instinctive, heady defender. Uh, and certainly a guy that's going to have no problem transitioning to the league from day one. Chargers back on the board at 23. They will get a wide receiver in Brian Thomas Jr. This feels like a pretty good haul, right? Uh, J.C. Latham, and then you circle back and get one of the fastest guys in the draft class. And, and here's the thing as I look at their depth chart. They have Josh Parma, who's an underrated player, really good out of Tennessee. And you have Quentin Johnson, who struggled last year as a first rounder. And Brian Thomas Jr. plays primarily outside. And I think this is an opportunity for Quentin Th Johnson to kick inside, play some slot, perhaps get a few easier reps and rely on him uh, playing inside, which he was able to do in college, and let Brian Thomas Jr. Just take the top off the coverage. He, uh, Justin Herbert is not going to out throw Brian Thomas Jr., even though he has a huge arm. And I think this gives that offense some versatility and allows Greg Roman to do uh, both what he likes to do, run the ball, and then open things up with one of the most dynamic deep threats in college football. I love the idea of pairing Justin Herbert, Brian Thomas Jr., uh, a guy that caught 17 touchdowns, I believe led the NCAA. Uh, he also played on the same team as Malik Neighbor. So when you think about explosive dynamic, I think you brought up last week, how many of those came out of the slot, right, on a slot fade? So Brian Thomas Jr., he is a mismatch. Uh, and this is the guy the Chargers have really been searching for on the outside. Mike Williams a couple years ago, that didn't work out. They're still trying to find that guy. Keenan Allen gone to Chicago. So there is a lot of production that they're going to have to replace. Brian Thomas Jr., I said it last week. Ryan, you made the George Pickens comp. I think this guy, in terms of best football, it's all ahead of him. Uh, and we saw a lot of flashes of what he can be last year, but I still think there's a lot of clay to develop there. That makes me more excited about Brian Thomas Jr. more than anything. Justin Herbert going to be very happy about this draft. Moving on to the 24th overall pick, the Dallas Cowboys will select offensive tackle Amarius Mims. And this is a team in Dallas, Emily, that could be interested in moving up for one of these offensive tackles. Tyron Smith is gone. Tyler Smith probably kicks outside. He played tackle in college, played left guard the last few years. And in Amarius Mims, you get, you talk about a, a molding a piece of clay. This is, the, number one, the, the biggest piece of clay you'll ever see in person. And number two, the athleticism is through the roof in this young man. I think he's a better athlete than Broderick Jones. He's not a better player just because he hasn't played a lot of football. But I think you have someone who can grow to the role and be truly special. The only thing, Coop, is you have to get him the experience and you got to keep him on the field because he battled injuries last year. Yeah, former five-star, certainly a guy that was so fascinating coming out of high school uh, and then had the recruitment. you got to remember, dipped his toes in the transfer portal. A lot of people thought he was going to Florida State. He ends up staying at Georgia. I think that ends up being the right move for him and more than likely going to be a first-round draft pick. When you talk about 
uh, fit. And we've talked about that a lot in the last couple of picks. Jerry Jones, Dallas Cowboys. You talk a little bit about availability, dependability. That's where Jerry Jones seems to find his value. Ryan, in your write-up, you talk about Amarius Mims being a guy that has potential top 15 talent. Well, you got Dallas sitting here in the 20s. They seem to be in the right situation to be able to grab a guy like that, especially at a position of need. I think this makes a lot of sense for the Cowboys. Packers selecting at 25, and they will pick cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry. Yeah, so Kool-Aid answered a lot of questions when he ran at the Pro Day a few weeks ago in Tuscaloosa and ran a 4-4-7. He suffered the foot injury at the Combine, wasn't able to run, and he's going to be healthy and, and ready to go. And coming into the season, we talked about this last week, Coop, he was cornerback one, not only at Alabama, but in the country. And then Terry and Arnold had the season he did, and Kool-Aid wasn't quite as electric. But I think he adds depth, some much-needed depth, in Green Bay, where they've struggled with the injuries on the back end. They have J Alexander Jair, who's a special talent. Jair Alexander, excuse me. And then opposite that, you get someone like Kool-Aid. If he can ret return to the form that we saw in 2022, uh, then you're cooking with gas in the NFC North. Yeah, best name on the draft board. Uh, I haven't been through all seven rounds of the mock yet, but I love Kool-Aid McKintree. Another guy, former five-star. You think about Alabama, Terry and Arnold, the same, right? So you think about development there in Tuscaloosa. Those two guys come to mind. It's kind of Nick Saban's last touch on it, but Terry and Arnold, one of the best cover corners, uh, certainly in the country over the last couple of years. And Ryan touched on it. I think this is a guy that's answered a lot of questions with his play speed versus verified speed and being able to run in the 4-4 is going to be big for him. I think Green Bay actually gets some pretty good value here. Death, taxes, and Alabama cornerbacks. He is also a former five-star number one corner in the 2021 class. So here's your recap of picks 21 through 25. The Chargers get the second LSU wide receiver to go in Brian Thomas Jr. at 23. Cowboys get some help up front for whoever is playing quarterback for Dallas in the future. With the Georgia offensive tackle, Amarius Mims. And Packers continue to trend defense in the first round. Let's go to pick 26. Buccaneers are on the clock, and they will select offensive tackle Graham Barton. Yeah, Graham Barton's another one of these guys who's going to kick inside of the next level. Uh, he more than held his own at the left tackle position for Duke. Reminded me a little bit of Zion Johnson. He played outside for BC before moving inside, and he ended up being a first-round pick. And I think what you get in Tampa Bay, Ryan Jensen's retired. Uh, and he was one of the nastiest office, interior offensive linemen in recent NFL history. And Graham Barton is a great athlete. Uh, he's relatively stout at the point. You see that there. And I think when he kicks inside, he's going to bring that athleticism. They got the quarterback situation taken care of, Coop, because they re up Baker Mayfield. So now they can focus on protecting him with a guy like Graham Barton. I've waited 46 minutes to talk about this guy, and I got to watch him today. We didn't get to talk about him last week. And, you know, he's played a lot of left tackle at Duke. I turned on the tape today and you just see the center traits really kind of pop off the screen. I would not be shocked if he is the first center to come off the board. And we talked about Jackson Powers Johnson. But anytime you take a tackle and you move him inside, there's some question marks there. But you love the fact, even at 6'5", some shorter arms, that he has been able to sustain and play at a really high level at Duke on that left side. So all those physical traits seem so seamless when you project a guy like Graham Barton to the center position. And I think this is a dude, you just watch him on tape. He bores you with how productive he is. And I love watching this guy's ability to move people, but also his ability to get to the second level, come off blocks, redirect, uh, pretty uncanny. So this guy, along with Byron Murphy, a handful of other names, he was one of my favorites to watch. Well, Coop, since you were so excited to talk about him, I got to ask a follow-up question uh, because if he is someone who's going to kick inside, I mean, there's a learning curve that comes with that. You both mentioned it, but what, gives you confidence that Barton can adjust to that learning curve. Because, Ryan, you referred to him as a day one starter potential. So, Coop, you take it. Yeah, I think tackle, left tackle especially, one of the most difficult positions uh, to play in all of football at every level. But you think about a guy like Grant Barton, what I mentioned, if you can play left tackle, you have that athleticism to live on that island. You saw the clip there versus Jared Verse, the ability to play in a zone or power scheme. I think playing inside – when you're playing in a phone booth and it's more condensed space, that's an advantage uh, to these guys that transition maybe from perimeter tackles moving inside. So that's what you want. You want that position flexibility in terms of the value as well. The fact that he can do a left tackle, that means if you get in a pinch, maybe you can play right. Maybe you can put this guy at right guard. But for sure, you got a center prospect that can do a lot of different things, uh, highly intelligent, highly functional athlete as well. So I think, you know, when I talk about J.C. Latham, and that position flex, uh, that 
is something that I think a lot of NFL teams will look at and say, hey, we can't go wrong with this guy. Where a Jackson Powers Johnson, he hadn't played left tackle, right? He, he's played a little bit of guard, but this is a guy maybe when you're looking and comparing the two, I think Barton has a little bit of an advantage there. So that's maybe some of the conversations that are taking place behind the scenes. Yeah, attrition is inevitable. So uh, NFL guys love them some versatility, and this is certainly a guy that would bring that. At number 27, the Arizona Cardinals will select Edge Leatu Latu. One of my favorite players in this draft class, Emily, but I'll say quickly while uh, Coop was talking, I, I looked it up real quick. Uh, Graham Barton had a better three cone time than Cody Schrader, the running back out of Missouri, and he had a, a similar short shuttle. So that speaks to the athleticism that Coop was talking about and, and allowing that move inside. So no disrespect to Cody Schrader. I think it speaks more to how good Graham Barton is as an athlete. But in terms of Layatu Latu, another fantastic athlete, and we heard you talk about this last week, Coop, uh, the best technician as a pass rusher, the only question is, is injuries. And if he's healthy, he's going to go way higher than this. And Arizona not only gets their wide receiver and elite neighbors, they circle back and get one of the best, best edge rushers in this class. This team is ready to compete in the NFC, and those two guys are going to go a long way to helping that. Yeah, if you're GM, uh, Monty Austin for it there in Arizona or a Cardinals fan, that's just an A+. plus. Just scribble it in, right? We love those immediate post-draft grades. That's one of those. If you get Malik neighbors, you get layout through lot too. We talked about him at length last week in terms of what this guy can do. One of the most mature pass rushing games uh, of any other edge rusher on the board. So they ought to lot to deep in the twenties would be an absolute steal. All right, Ryan, the Buffalo bills giving you a little extra work, having to go back in and adjust the mock draft with the Stefan Diggs trade. And it uh, looks like that you think they'll bring in some help for uh, the bills at wide receiver position at 28. They have AD Mitchell drafting him. Yeah, and, and part of me wonders if this is going to end up being Lad McConkey. I love both these players. They're different type players. A.D. Mitchell uh, is 40 pounds heavier than Xavier Worthy and ran a 4-3-3, I believe. So he has the juice, and he can win at all three levels. A lot of times players like this are just deep threats. He can win on the short, intermediate, and deep routes. And I think when you have Josh Allen throwing you lasers, it's going to make your job even easier. And he's going to be asked to do a lot early because, as you mentioned, Emily, Steph Diggs is now in Houston, and they did sign Curtis Samuel to have Khalil Shakir but I think a player, whoever it is, whether it's A.D. Mitchell or someone else, is going to be asked to do a lot early, uh, Coop, when they get to Buffalo because they just have needs in the position now. Deep, deep, deep receiver year, right? We talked about the names at the top of the board, Neighbors, Adunze, Marvin Harrison Jr. What about these guys at the back? A.D. Mitchell, you know, I kind of put him in that Brian Thomas Jr. category. Like, I think there's a lot of meat left on the bone in terms of physical development, what this guy can do. I love the wiggle in terms of his ability to create separation. You turn on that Alabama game, I actually thought he gave Perry and Arnold a lot of fits. I love his ability to get vertical as well. So you think about pairing him with a guy like Josh Allen, that explosive of an offense. Talk about playing off schedule as well. There are going to be a lot of opportunities there. Really, really like that fit, A.D. Mitchell to Buffalo. Yeah, so if the Bills don't end up going edge here, then the Lions at 29 luck out with Chop Robinson. That's right. You got it. And here's the thing. Chop weighed in the 250s uh, once he got to the combine. I didn't think he played quite that strong, and I want to see him get stronger at the point. But the good news is he's got a running mate, Aiden Hutchinson, on the other side of him to take up uh, some of that, uh, some of those offensive lines that are going to be concerned about Aiden as opposed to, to Chop. And, and Chop, there's no one with a higher motor in college football the way he played last year. And you might say, well, the production wasn't there because he only had four sacks. He is consistently disruptive. Uh, in the backfield, causing quarterbacks to get off their spot and then making them, forcing them into mistakes. And I think that's what he brings to the next level. I know the Lions signed Marcus Davenport. He had the former first-round pick in New Orleans, and I love the idea of getting Aiden Hutchinson, one more guy to help take the pressure off of him, allow him to do his things uh, along that front four. Yeah, I think the best first step of any edge rusher that I've watched, I mean, it certainly stands out. I think the other thing about him that you don't really mention a lot, but how about the hand quickness? I, I think that is kind of what really separates him. He's got some speed to power ability as well. I think you mentioned it, Ryan. The one place area that he's got to get better is especially at the point of attack in the run game. I think he's got a tendency to get washed out a little bit too easily. You want to see him play north of that 250-pound frame, but you're talking about a pass rusher playing opposite of an all-pro like Aiden Hutchinson, being able to pair that too puts an immense amount of pressure on opposing offensive lines and quarterbacks as well from a game planning standpoint too. So I love the idea of pairing those two together. I don't think you can go wrong there if you're Detroit. 
So does Dan Campbell, uh, also a former five-star number two edge in the 2021 class. At 30, the Baltimore Ravens will select offensive lineman Tyler Guyton. Yeah, Morgan Moses, they moved on from him, so you need a right tackle. And Tyler Guyton played with Anton Harrison a few years ago at Oklahoma. He was the first-round pick of the Jaguars last year, played really well in, in, in uh, being forced into duty. Harrison had to move to the right side. I think Guyton showed that he is an incredible athlete who is just raw. He, he's going to get better. You see him here. He moves well in space. He can maintain blocks on the move. And I think in, in uh, Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, he's going to have to do a better job of maintaining those blocks. But the athleticism is what gets your attention. He showed a lot of the, the power at the point when he was at the Senior Bowl going up against some really stiff competition. I, I like him here at 30. This feels like you're, you're stealing almost this late in the draft. 6'7", 328 pounds. Baltimore's got a type when it comes to offensive linemen. They like those big guys. Orlando Brown a couple years ago, uh, you think about what they've done at that position. Tyler Guyton, like you said, you see the athlete. It is very difficult to find guys with that size, that weight, move the way that Tyler Guyton does, especially with ease at the second level. I think the biggest thing with him is going to have to tighten up that footwork, that timing at the point of attack. I think sometimes can find himself out of position more often times than not. But in terms of the physical toolkit, it's all there. Uh, and this is certainly a guy with his frame from day one is going to be able to cover up a lot of things that need to continue to develop just because of his sheer size. So uh, I'm with you, Ryan, at number 30. I think Baltimore is probably running up to the podium uh, with a guy that really kind of fits their needs and who they are on the offensive line. Let's get to the Super Bowl teams. At 31, the 49ers will select cornerback Enos Rakestraw Jr. And Emily, I wonder if this is a spot where the 49ers might look to trade down. I have a ton of needs, but if they do stay put, Ennis Rakestraw Jr. is one of my favorite players in this draft class. He's slightly undersized by your typical NFL cornerback standards, but when I watch him play, he didn't run quite as fast as Devin Witherspoon, but he plays with that sort of intensity. He is looking to run through you like he is a linebacker, and he is very angry. He does have ball skills. I think he's pretty good in terms of staying in phase down the field. I love the way he plays, and he feels like he would be – he would fit in well on that 49ers defense that starts with Fred Warner setting the tone and everyone follows. I feel like Ennis Rakestraw Jr. would fit right in uh, because of his physicality, his ball skills, and his ability to, to play man coverage. Smart, tough, instinctive. We talked a little bit about his positional flexibility last week as well. You love the intensity, Ryan, the energy that he plays with. I think that's palpable, especially when you have a guy at that position. So you think about all those things, the versatility, obviously a smart instinctive player, all those things I just talked about, but the intangibles really kind of pop off the screen when you talk about Enos Rigstraw, really, really good fit for San Francisco, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan. They made a living off of these type of guys drafting really well in the day two, day three range. They get a really good one here at the bottom of the first. And we are going back to normal in the NFL draft with a clean 32 pick. So with the final pick in the first round, the Super Bowl champs, Kansas City Chiefs will select wide receiver Lad McConkey. So, Coop, I'm not going to talk a lot. I want to hear your thoughts on, on Ladd. He is, I mentioned Ennis Rakestraw, one of my favorite players. Ladd might be number one. I think he's flown under the radar somehow the entire time. R Rashi Rice may not be there at the start of the season. He's had some off-field concerns. And uh, what does it do for you to see Patrick Mahomes get someone like Ladd McConkey running routes for him both inside and out? It reminds me of a couple years ago when Kansas City drafted Clyde Edwards Elair. And, and there's been some, you know, mixed reviews on how that marriage has worked out so far. But it was like, it's a luxury take, right? You're coming off a Super Bowl winning season. What's the one piece we got to sure up? And you mentioned Rashi Rice, but the thing about Ladd McConkey that I love is his ability to separate, his ability to change gears. And I love his route tempo. I think it's pretty rare, uh, the ability to kind of throttle down and create consistent separation, whether it's off the line of scrimmage or whether it's at the top of the route. And you give Patrick Mahomes, a guy like that, pair him up with a guy like Travis Kelsey, who's also very good in that area. This guy is so instinctive, the combination, speed, quickness, suddenness. It's really, really hard to find. And if he's sitting there at 32, uh, you got to think Andy Reid, Brett Veach, uh, who have done just a tremendous job, similar to Philadelphia, letting the board kind of fall to them and taking the best player available. I love this kid. Uh, he was one of the best players on one of the best programs in the last three years. Sometimes just don't overthink it. Uh, and this guy, you know, quite honestly, outside of that, I think he ran in the low four fours as well. So he plays as fast as the verified speed as well. I'm a huge, huge fan of Lab McConkey. 
Love it. There you have it. The final group of picks, 26 through 32. The Bills pivot to a wide receiver after the Diggs trade. Lions beef up the pass rush even more. And the Super Bowl champs landing Ryan Wilson's favorite player at the buzzer. Guys, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I know it was a lot going through every single pick, but I feel like I learned so much from both of you. Um, and I'm going to tell the viewers where they can get more information and listen to you guys even more. Um, both have podcasts. Let's pub the With the First Pick podcast. Ryan Wilson and former NFL GM Rick Spielman get you ready to go for the upcoming NFL draft. You can check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Also, get ready for Portal Palooza again. That's right, Coop. We'll steer the ship for three hours as we make sure that you know every major move made during the spring portal window and, of course, what it all means for the college football landscape. So be sure to tune in to the 24-7 Sports YouTube page Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern to watch it all go down. Thanks so much for watching.